Jenkins, and part of that thinking director at the Centre for Thinking Futures, is going to tell us his talk is in parity, service dominant logic and the architecture of enterprise. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I stand between you and lunch, which is a bad place to be. Um, maybe it's even worse than being immediately after lunch. Um, I did plan this to be an hour, including some questions. I'll do my best, uh, but we'll see how we get on. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to be with you. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm going to talk about imparity. Uh, it's a subject that uh, I have a certain amount of trepidation talking about because the gentleman who is responsible for bringing it to us is sitting here, and I do hope you will forgive me if I go wandering off into the wilderness, into territory you had not imagined, nor perhaps do you agree with. Um, but I do want to I do want to talk about imparity, and I want it to be a central theme because I think it's a significantly underregarded aspect of cybernetics, and I think that it inaugurates the possibility for a whole new concept of cybernetics, and I think that in the process of doing so, it inaugurates the possibility of a new way of doing science. I think it's a way of doing science that is, that is progressing. There are lots of strands in which this is happening in different fields, but I think that we will not be able to solve any of the problems that have been, we've been hearing about this morning without, without working with, in this kind of a way. So I do want to emphasize that particular aspect. I also want to say that my, my background is eclectic career-wise. I have been a teacher. I have been a, uh, an IBMer. I've been a software systems designer and a, and a tech entrepreneur. I've been a consultant. I've been an academic and professor, um, do independent research. So I've, I've covered a lot of ground that seems to be quite disparate, but there is a, what, for me at any rate, appears like a red thread appearing. In a session like this, it's impossible to cover, you know, you, you, you cannot tell the truth in any rigorous sense. All you can do is download, attempt to share a certain portion of what needs to be said and in the process of doing that, you filter out all sorts of stuff, you say things in a simple way, you talk about this and you don't talk about all the caveats and so on. So I hope you will forgive me, I will do my best. In many ways, everything I'm going to be saying could be encapsulated in this slide and perhaps the one that follows. So you could treat it as a kind of a summary. This is an ostrich pillow. That's what it's called. It's the Mark I version. They have simpler versions that have come along later. Uh, but it's designed so that you, for example, Peter would be able to put it on uh, in his plane, cover himself up, be in a cocoon, and sleep very well. You can keep out, depending on how you turn it round, you can be in the dark, you can cut out some noise, you can protect your head, and you can go to sleep. And the question is, would you buy and wear one of these? And people do. And other people look at it and say, I couldn't possibly wear a thing that looks like that. It makes me look like a dork. How on earth could I wear that? Now, I'm proposing to you that there's nothing in the pure information, especially information, in the way that it is defined within cybernetics and physics and whole avenues, domains of science today, there's nothing in information that would be enough to answer the question, would you or wouldn't you wear this? And yet it's simply um, perhaps an extreme example of an everyday question that is answered billions and trillions of times by people all over the world. I regard uh, cybernetics as an evolving science to the extent that it is a kind of wonderful meta-science for understanding 
directiveness in human behavior. I think everything, every human activity all the time can be called cybernetic. And the behavior of every living creature, organism on the planet is always, in that sense, cybernetic. What we're trying to do is find ways to understand it, explain it, perhaps predict it, model it, create, in a number of cases, things like organizations, which is my key field, find ways of actually organizing and managing these great lumbering beasts called companies in such ways that they can actually be productive and useful to human beings. And when we take a second example, the phenomenon that's going on in Britain, for example, and around the world, I don't believe that we can explain what's happening in our present socio-political society without looking at something like imparity as a way of doing it. And imparity is our best, our best route into it at the moment. So when we look at the kinds of things, and, and everything here in a, in a sense has been brought by Peter and David and Martin. They've all talked about aspects. Everything that they've said would be true. Martin was talking about sentiment and feelings and reactions and how people do. We're talking about truth and value judgments in the previous talk. David was talking about the problems of economy and GDP and how can GDP work more effectively for us. All of these problems, and indeed all of these problems of our society and the crisis, I think these are very real, substantial problems. And if we do not have a science that's capable of actually dealing with them and has a rigorous domain, we have a problem. So. Uh, I shared an abstract beforehand. I'm going to talk at this point about imparity. I'm going to talk about something called service dominant logic, which was a marketing paradigm that was developed and published in 2004, but it's been 100 years in the making, and no doubt it will be 100 years in the, in the development. I'm going to talk about the implications of those and maybe some potential new areas that we could get involved in. So my agenda in this session is to talk uh, not to talk about the logic of the presentation, but in the presentation, the presentation will be available. There will be a short, <coughs> simple summary logic at the beginning, and there will be an end, more detailed logic that I will share in the version. I also have a number of propositions that I'm trying to defend. Again, I'm not going to go through them in this talk, in particular, partly to save time. I do want to talk a bit about context, about situation, the concept of a situation and about control in relationship to goals, service dominant logic, imparity, and the architecture of enterprise. And what does that then lead to us to? So let me just introduce and say something about, as context for what I'm saying, something about the notion of situation in particular in relationship to also to goals. Um, what is a situation? A situation is a multidimensional, polydimensional space, a descriptive space, a qualitative space, a hermeneutic space. It is everybody in, is in this room, and I'm one person talking, and you're all listening, and yet every single person in this room is in their own specific, precise situation. And the moment you try and describe to yourself what situation you're in, you have changed your situation by the process of describing it. And as you describe it, your situation will keep evolving. So a situation can be many, many. There's many, many aspects. And in a sense, what appears in a situation are the aspects that you choose to pay attention to. And everybody filters out from all of the possibility those things that they do pay attention to. There are, if you were to put it in digital terms, and I think that would be a mistake in some ways, but if you were to do it and play with it, there'd be terabytes of potential that we could be saying that we were experiencing at any moment in time. What goes on within that, and I'm using some terminology developed by Owen Barfield, who's a philosopher I think really deserves a lot, of, a lot more attention. Um, 
And I like his terminology and his description in part because it gets rid of some of the baggage. Um, so he talks about out there there is, so we're saying everything I'm saying, and it may be useful to say this, I'm at no point am I going to introduce anything that I would call metaphysical, except in the old Greek sense of the word. Um, Aristotle's metaphysics simply said you cannot, it's things that are not perceptible to the senses. Thought, for example, unless we say, which we could, that we have the sense to be able to observe thoughts, thoughts are not tangible as I experience them. But I don't have to make them metaphysical in order to say that I have thoughts. So there's something out there, and it's not a Kantian thing in itself, there's simply there's some reality out there, there's some experiential possibility, and out of all of that, each individual figures. There's a figuration process that produces a representation, and therefore, thereby a situation that we are in. To that situation, that's been produced by the kind of values by which we filter the world and know the situation, become in the situation that we're in. And once in that situation, it has a value for us. At that mo this moment, you think, I need a glass of water, and the glass is empty, and my situation has changed. Or I want to eat, or this is interesting, or this is uninteresting. And so depending on each moment's situation, we do some more figuration of what's going on, and that produces another situation, and more figuration, and so we go round and round this loop, which we'll return to. And also look at it this way, and say, there are many such loops, and there's only a few such things that I'm going to introduce today, but we can look at figuration out of the raw phenomena once again, and we have our own personal representation. This sinks down into memory. It becomes colored with our own personal emotions. This is the situation I was in, it's mine. And it's in the emotion that it becomes most personal. Those then lead to what Barfield calls collective representations. Some of you may know terms like memes and things like that. Society starts to form itself by its adoption of these collective representations. Science is full of them. Every single scientific term like information or in parity or cybernetics is something whereby there's some kind of shared collective representation. And we bandy those collective representations around and we spend a lot of time dealing not with raw phenomena, not with the real world, but actually with collective representations of it, which are often abstractions and many of them can be downright lies. Certainly they can be mistaken, but they're at least perceptions. And what you can say is that somebody like the Bank of England makes some statement and the collective representation of one group of people and the collective representation of another group of people of that event is quite different. If we then look at that one, one frame for thinking about any kind of event, such as a meeting between a company and a customer, which is going to be one of the fields I'm most interested in. Any kind of situation, such as the one we're in right now, you can look at it and say, well, it has a kind of space of interaction. It takes place in space. It has physical properties that belong to that space. Those are not only quantitative, but they're also qualitative. In their, if, this, if this ceiling was half the height, we would be in a different space, and the mood of the room would change. We're also in a process. This is time. So we're in space, and we're in time. Time is flowing. Time, you cannot actually ever see anything. Because we're in process and flow, you know, you actually only perceive that I'm here and doing something because you, you slide it across in your memory and you build a relationship over a period of time and hold it as a unity. We live in a social field, an emotional field, an interactional field between people, 
and we have intentions, goals, purposes, things that are going on. And all of these are not four, they're not four separate things, they're just four aspects. It's the situation that you can describe, they're four aspects of the unity that's taking place, mine, yours, each person's, all the time. And then I want to introduce, remind you, I imagine, or perhaps there is someone who's not familiar with it, the principle of perceptual, or the theory of perceptual control, which was developed by Bill Powers. Uh, Bill Powers was another, uh, was a control engineer who, like other control engineers, got interested in cybernetics. He developed this theory of perceptual control. Uh, I think that some of the language in which it's expressed is very attractive to engineers, but doesn't lead it to become picked up by people in other fields. And that's a great pity because I think it's an extremely powerful theory. And it explains uh, a good deal about the nature of behavior. What, in essence, he says is that all, all behavior of all living things, at least, all living things, including me, you, is purposeful, and we act in order to control an outcome that we're trying to bring about. If I want to drink some water, I'm controlling my action to bring about the process that the water goes in my mouth and I swallow it as opposed to down my shirt. The method by which that happens, the functional process, involves the control of perception. I alter my behavior so that the world looks the way I want it to look. If I find that my glass is going to my right ear, I know that that's not going to put it into my mouth, and so I adjust my behavior. If I see that my car is drifting off the side of the road, I bring it back into the lane it's supposed to be in. If I see that my wife is getting cross, I change what I'm doing. So I'm constantly behaving in such a way that the world unfolds the way I want it to unfold now, right now, in order that it will lead to where I want it to be at some future time. I work on the essay that I have to produce to deliver tomorrow morning if I'm a student, so that I will get through my exams, so that I will end up with a degree, so that I will end up with somewhere else in the my life. So we're always in a kind of process in which we're concentrating on different time zones and we're paying attention to the now as part of that longer process. That's my, that's my computer telling me what time it is and you too. So we're constantly internally directing our behavior and the key thing in this is that we are internally controlling our behavior. There's nothing external that controls our behavior. In fact, the opposite. Human beings act in order to cancel out anything that interferes with or perturbs us doing what we want to do. And it's not only us. That would be true, for example, of a worm or a rabbit, every living thing. So. Behavior is internally organized. This is consistent also with what you'd find in autopiasis. It's internally organized. It's internally controlled. It has a goal, cybernetic, and it acts to correct anything that is taking me off course. This, by the way, means that all sorts of theories of ch design, of change, whether it's political or organizational or scientific or whatever, that include any kind of notion of external causality as a mechanism by which we want to think about it, or which assumes that it, change is actually difficult to achieve, is basically flawed. So unless we start building some of these kinds of premises, I would argue, into our way of thinking about problems, we will never solve the very many mighty and significant crises that I think the world faces today. They're economic, we've heard. They are ecological. There was a huge strikes by children all over the world yesterday, and whatever you may think about it, it's an, in, there are real issues that have to be solved at an ecological level, and so on. So we'll never be able to solve it, 
And we won't even be able to run our great big huge organizations very well. Senior people in organizations are frequently, uh, will admit in private and sometimes in public, that they no longer know how to run their big companies successfully. So we need some new premises. Which brings me to my second principle, service dominant logic. This is a theory that was published in 2004 by two people, um, Vargo and Lush. Amer they're American professors, one based in Hawaii. I've met them and talked with them and um, had some interesting, they're interesting people. Um, they, their, their publication took over a complete, um, a complete journal of a, the most prestigious marketing journal. Um, it's created the largest amount of interest in the marketing community of anything in the last 20 odd years. Um, they admit, in fact, they make a real point of saying that what they're doing is something that's got 100 years of history. And I would say myself that in my own book in the 1990s, I anticipated many of the things that are in this. What is the point of what they're trying to say? They suggest that um, business, marketing, sales, the whole enterprise co of the commerce has been dominated by a mass industrialized, but the key point is goods dominant logic. We thought in terms of companies making goods that people buy. And the assumption is that the value that goods contain are already in the goods and people buy the goods, and in the process of buying the goods, they get the value. What Vargo and Lush, Lush and Vargo have proposed, is that this is not in fact the case. People don't buy goods and get already built in value. Value is something that is co-created. You design value propositions. You design offerings, things that you can sell, and they say, say, therefore, there is no such thing as goods and services. You know that in the Brexit negotiations that um, Prime Minister May uh, negotiated, there was a deal that covered goods, but it didn't cover services. That, that for Vargo and Lush, would be an economic misunderstanding of reality. Um, what in fact happens is that all companies exchange services for services. Um, at a basic level, they hand something over and they get money back and the money provides a service to the company. You don't want money for the sake of money, you want money for what money will do for you. So you can have the concept of a job to be done, that, that we buy a chair to sit on, we come to a conference to learn something new, or whatever, and this brings us back to our situation. We're in some situation, we have some needs, we buy something, they satisfy it, and our situation changes, and we have certain re responses in terms of how we feel, how well it meets our goal, and how we therefore will behave in the future. So I'm connecting up all of the things that we've just been talking about in my earlier context section and saying, so people don't simply buy goods, they don't buy things, they buy meaning and the emotional value, the emotional um, experience that that gives them. They choose amongst options, value propositions that different companies have. You walk down the road and you see this cafe and you see that cafe and you go into this one, not that one. They gain value. And from the job to be done, and the company in return gets money, which is a service, and it also gets some other things like reputation, resources, success, and so forth. It's a cybernetic structure. And you can look at some different examples here. Companies design and offer these things, and what people buy is things that will give them these things. Now, we can't adequately explain this whole structure by 
second order cybernetics or general systems theory or any kind of psychology or anything else that aims to be a kind of meta-psychology that would be universal or meta-science meta that would be universal across all fields. You can't explain that with the present ontology. Um, energy certainly plays a role throughout everything that I've been describing. Information, even information the way it is somewhat narrowly defined within the literature, formally it plays a role in a hermeneutic sense. But it's still ontologically underdetermined. It would not be enough to fully explain what goes on. In any of the talks that we've heard today, in what I'm saying right now, or uh, the kinds of examples of a company delivering services to another company or people. So we need to add something else in order to explain that. We need something that would cover emotion, imagination, conscience was a term we were just hearing about just now, purpose, and so forth. And, and this is what Dr. Stewart produced, uh, an, an additional domain of imparity. And I think that if this was fully worked through and we developed it, um, this, is, this has got Nobel Prize willing significance. Because at the moment, I think the basic, the basic epistemology of science, as I come across it, is pretty broken. Biology and physics and sociology and psychology are in different camps. They don't fully recognize each other. They question each other. And we don't have anything like a joined up understanding of what constitutes a complete ability to analyze the domain of ordinary experience of everyday life. And if we reduce everything just to numbers and to pure information, most people, most scientists, would feel that that's only dealing with a small portion. It's a situation, for sure, but it's a narrow situation within the totality of what actually exists. Christopher Alexander, who's an architect that I have quite a lot of time for as a theoretician, he used to be a Harvard mathematician, ma mathematics professor, <coughs> before he became a Harvard architecture professor, um, published a big four-volume tome. It's an impressive work called The Nature of Order. And it explores, through architecture, he's attempting to explain the nature of order in the universe. And it's, um, he's saying that for architects, when you build a building, when you build something, you build something that people can appreciate aesthetically, that they can want to have, and that has certain responses. And if we do not have a science that takes into account those qualitative, aesthetic, emotional, imaginative, and other dimensions, then we don't have an adequate science for explaining the world. And if we don't have such a science, we will not be able to solve ecological crises, economic crises, social crises, and so on, which will only get worse as the century goes on. So, a picture. It's a hummingbird. Um, I... I want to make sure I've got this right. I think his name is Peter Robinson. Uh, Tim, sorry, Tim Burkhead. He's an amazing guy. He, he's spent something like 45 years studying guillemots uh, on an island. He knows a great deal about birds. And he's written a lovely book about them, which The Guardian reviewed. And I've got some information there in the slide that I just showed that I'm hiding. Um, and it talks, The Guardian talks about the marvels. That this, we don't know everything that we can, everything that's possible. What would it like, be like to be a bird? We can't know all of that. But we can appreciate the marvels. 
And the, it's the ability to appreciate marvels, which seems to me to be very important for humanity. And indeed, the questions that we heard, Peter asking questions. Well, questions are interesting. All questions are forms of marvel. So we need a science that would cope with that. It, we need a science that can respond to our response to discovering um, that, for example, um, ears are separated so that sound coming to them reaches one ear before the other. But in the case of a little bird, like a sparrow or a cock robin, it's, it takes a millionth of a second, the difference between one ear and the other ear. And so the bird's got to be adjusting its behavior to listen for dealing with that. Or the fact that nightingales in Berlin sing 14 decibels above other normal nightingales because the sound level is so high, so they go louder. But other birds cut through it by changing the pitch. They go up in pitch so that they can be heard above it. And uh, so the, the different ways in which, according to the situation they're in, animals adapt and change their behavior is very marvelous to experience that. And they themselves, uh, what, what we're told is that the more you start to observe it, you get to the point where every guillemot becomes an individual bird. And not just an individual bird, and there's thousands of them, not just an individual bird for the observer, the naturalist, but also an individual bird to the other birds. And so there's an emotional response between the birds. Now, we need a science that can cope with those sorts of things and also, in the process, perhaps create robots, solve problems of truth, create economic systems that work, create medical systems that also answer the question, how do people feel during the process, and so on. So I would, I propose that in order, and I'm not going to try and defend in parity in detail, um, Dr. Stewart has written papers that argue this in some detail, and I'd recommend them to you. What I'm simply saying is that it exists, and it's a, it's a proposal that says that in addition to energy, and information, which is a measure of difference, we have to add the fact that there is another kind of difference. And this difference lies in the evaluative choice between options. Why would I stand here rather than here? And I, well, I'm in somebody's way, so I st stepped a bit out of the way to get a bit less in his way. Okay, that's some information, but why did I do it? And I don't believe that if you try and, if you try and shoehorn that into an energy and information pair of domains, you'll always struggle, because it will leave out the issues of my purpose, my goals, my emotional responses, his my perceptions of his emotional responses, and a whole lot of other things. I don't think that we would be able to explain democracy, the organization of Facebook and its likes, poetry, any ordinary sentence, every page in this presentation, your response to every page in this presentation. I also think that imparity provides the functional um, the function for organizational closure. You know that organizations and organisms in autopoiesis and cybernetics are so-called organizationally closed. That means that, uh, as I talked about earlier on, as a human being, I control myself from within. Um, the immune system is an organizational closure that keeps things out that shouldn't come in, and if they do come in, then it tries to correct it. And the model that you saw of um, the bad guys being corrected by the good guys in the, in the IoT or the um, car system in, in Peter's presentation would be another example of a kind of organizational closure at a societal level. So I also think that we need to probably expand our whole understanding of differentia and, and difference. Um, in particular, 
the intellect is an organ of analysis that produces assessment of difference. It produces differences and it compares differences. So it looks at differences of differences. And ever since the Greeks, when the intellect took off as a technique, as a tool, as a capability in human beings, and really it's not that ancient, the intellect, um, it's been an extremely important, the dominant cognitive mechanism of human beings. But it's not the only way in which human beings can and do know the world. So we need to expand, I believe, our repertoire. But that would take me too much beyond the space of here. I want to turn instead and say, if I summarize, I've said every event takes place in a situation. The situation is hermeneutic. It's determined by each individual, even in shared spaces like these. Each person is within their own situation. That situation is something that produces other situations and reproduces itself, as we'll see. And we act as individuals within that. Organizations provide offerings to people that people choose to buy for what they will do for them. And what they will do for them is always an experience. I wear a, I wear a jacket to get warm, or to look good, or to have a certain status symbol, or to please my wife, or whatever reason I have. And that has meaning and it has emotion. And I've said that we therefore need to have within our science a structure that includes not only energy and information, but we also need imparity as a way of analyzing if we're to understand, model, plan within that. So let's look at some aspects within the concept of organizations. And I want to draw an analogy with plants. Um, I came across some studies by John Harper and James White. Um, John Harper started the process off. He was a Cardiff professor of um, ecology, and his key field of interest was population studies amongst plants. He went out trying to count plants. The principle was that in, in every ecological study, you say, you know, how many rare, how rare are hippopotami, for example? Uh, how many goldfish are there in the world? So you, in order to be able to do ecology and so on, one of the things you need is a basic ability to count. And as soon as he came across plants, he found there was a major problem. It's very difficult to count plants. You can't really count plants because you actually don't even know quite what a plant is. You see there's a forest of trembling aspen in the United States which has got about 60,000 trees in it. But that's actually one tree. It's actually one tree, and because it's aspen, it spreads out, the roots go out, and trees come up from the roots. And this one tree is 60,000 years old, and it's been sending up trees for 60,000 years. And those trees die off, but other trees grow from the basic mat network of... Now, is this one tree or 60,000 trees? How many should it be counted? Moreover, when you look at a plant, what you find is that the plant is itself composed of plants. Every plant is a whole plant, and inside the plant are plants. Not just as inside us, there are cells, for example. But the particular thing about a plant is that the unit of which a plant is made is itself a plant. So that in, a, in certain kinds of trees, you can have between 100,000 and a million plants inside a plant composing the plant. Um, so how many plants are there in the world? Things like strawberries, if you look in your garden, you may have some strawberries growing and you know that's a very good example of one of these interesting kinds. Goethe, uh, um, Goethe discovered a principle of metamorphosis, a term that's somewhat in, entered into science and is considered to be um, mainstream botany today. Uh, he regarded himself as a more important scientist than dramatist or poet, which is what he's most famous for. Uh, and I think there's a good case for that. He brought in a qualitative mode of science and he brought in some very interesting observations. Um, 
if if I try and keep this to a minimum, these are leaves from one plant. You, there are many, many such examples, right? So you take one plant and you look at the leaves, and what you see is that each of the leaves belongs together. They're all individual leaves. None of them is exactly the same as any of the other leaves, but together they make up a process, a unified process. Um, when René Tom, the French, has it? Well, you can do that way, or I can do that way. Okay. When René Tom, the, um, the Fields Medalist mathematician, uh, visited a um, some castle somewhere in Poland, I think it was, somewhere else. He saw a whole series of um, stages in the fetus of a rabbit from very early days through to the end. And he saw that they were kind of like a punctuated process. Each one was captured at a certain point. So that each of them represented a kind of, his theory was, interest was catastrophe theory, a catastrophe. It was like arrested at that stage, arrested at that stage, and arrested at that stage. But what mattered was that there was a teleological process all the way through in which uh, the process of embryology was trying to produce a mature, a, a, a mature enough rabbit to be born, and then in due course, an adult rabbit. And that process produces variation all the way through. And in, the, and in a plant, what you see is that each of the leaves that appears is simply the version en route as it grows. And if you take a video and you watch a plant growing through its life, say 100 years or 10 years, you also see a series of stages in its growth through the process. This means that there is a diversity within unity, or a unity within diversity. And this principle of unity within diversity was, of course, first developed by Aristotle and, Pythag and Pythagoras, um, um, Heraclitus, the, the early Greeks were all it, mostly into this, this whole area. Uh, lots of other people have got interested in it. Um, Varela the, developed his not one, not two proposition in which he developed what's sometimes called star cybernetics as a way of resolving apparent difference between things as a unity. It's actually a commonplace. We recognize all of these three paintings as paintings by one artist, Van Gogh. Why? Because they share a style. And every artist produces a whole variety of different works that share a style. Every person produces a whole variety of activities over time that share a style. There's a unity within them. So we have a form of reality in which there can be variety and arrested stages in that within a unity, one concept. Now let's look at this as a kind of paradigm this process of a leaf, how a plant can be composed of leaves, which are themselves plants, and in different forms and of different types and of different shapes and diversity, and indeed the whole plant world is every plant form of every kind is one basic form that just varies. Let's take that concept, which you could look into um, in lots of areas where I won't go. And now let's take a model that looks at the relationship between a firm and a customer. Um, the firm is going through a process. It's in a situation, and it goes from situation to situation. Customer is in a situation, and goes from being in a situation, having a response to that, and wanting some kind of service which they experience, and there is a response to that. So they, they look for choice, they look for something, they want it, they choose between options, and then they have an evaluative experience. Meanwhile, the firm is also going around the same kind of cycle and meeting the customer, and at this point, the firm is making its own evaluation of what's going on and its own response, 
as the customer is. And that takes place in a meeting. Hopefully that's not too difficult. But now, imagine that inside the firm, that basic model is just repeated recursively at multiple levels of detail across and down, hierarchically down, conceptually hierarchically down, and certainly in terms of power structure <laughs> down, through the organization. Um, this university has a finance department. The finance department is producing offerings that are of service to other parts of the university. It has administration departments, cleaning departments, research departments, teaching departments, marketing departments, and all of these, many of these are servicing internal functions within the university. But in each case, they're producing offerings and getting rewarded in the form of continued funding, continued maintenance, reward, pats, various things. They're still in exactly the same process. So the organization is itself composed of service units. The whole organization is a service unit. It's composed of service units, and it buys from other service units. Indeed, there's a whole value stream all the way through. It's worth saying when I talk about value and service, I recognize that not all value and not all experience is good. I recognize there is manipulation, there are lies, there are all sorts of things. Uh, there was a question about where to look for in this area, and uh, the work of Professor Manfred Max Neef, Max hyphen Neef, N W E F, reference here, is worth looking at. He got an alternative Nobel Prize for economics, which maybe is better than the ordinary Nobel Prize, you might say, David, I don't know, um, for his work in looking at value and alternatives to GDP as ways of understanding it. And he talks about there being true value, or good rich value, um, simple value, pseudo value, and negative value. Um, so not all value is good, but if the organization or customer is minded in the proper way, then that acts as feedback and or corrective and leads to changes in behavior. Um, we can also look, by the way, at the organization and ask what is an organization if an organization also is organizationally closed, it has its own identity, it manages itself as a social, um, many people would say social organism and I'd be inclined to agree, in fact I do agree. And you can look at it from multiple points of view, it certainly all takes place in the same four domains of the physical, temporal process, immaterials and noetics and goals. And you can look at it and say there are multiple aspects of identity. How should we work together? What's our purpose? How do we make money? Where do we stand in the world? Where, what's distinct about us versus other companies? What's our vision of the future? And so on. This is actually a logical circle. It's like a Krebs cycle, but in a conceptual logical circle of organizational identity. And it constitutes, therefore, a set of goals that the organization has not because they're crafted from outside, but because you can find them actually functioning when the company is operative at its best. They're simply part of the character, the tenor, the abilities, the resources that take place in an organization. And therefore, the behavior of the organization tends towards trying to revert back to it being at its best. Very often they don't do a very good job of it, but that's the goal. So I've suggested that we need in parity in order to be able to explain not only what goes on in organizations. We cannot explain organizations, marketing, business, um, very ordinary, everyday, very important aspects of our lives. We cannot explain them with the present business models what's taught in business school and so on, and the frameworks that they use without including in parity, 
and developing a modality for, for analyzing the world that would include that. And if we can't in cybernetics do that, I don't believe that any other discipline can either. So we need this, and we need to confront a picture of an organization's as existing incredibly powerful, very significant parts of the world, and as means by which we can wreak havoc. People are very vulnerable to influences and behaviors, as we've seen, and we need to actually ensure that this behavior within this organization happens to some standards, and that requires, once again, something that only in parity can provide, at least at a modeling level. So what kinds of further applications might we have? Um, Briefly, I think we can look at various systemic theories. We can expand our systemic theories by looking in this way. Um, Gregory Bateson said a circular, a, a circular or more complex system of parts in which information flows that makes a difference. It was one of his key phrases of what he, was work, what he looked at. And mind is a circular or more complex system of parts in which information flows that makes a difference. But what is this making a difference? We heard earlier on, and there was a suggestion, I think, in Dr. Stewart's paper, one of Dr. Stewart's paper, that um, that difference, that actually the the information would provide that. But I think Bateson was always trying to look for what is the difference that makes a difference. It was his question all the time, and he never really answered it. I think the answer would be better found when we introduced in parity. And so at a systems level, philosophical level, I think it's a tool that would really help us to understand ourselves and the world. I think that in parity changes information and information changes in parity. So the modeling around these two and how they reflect each other would be useful in business analysis, architecture, economics, politics, biological studies, you name it. Uh, the same thing happens when we factor in, of course, energy, which can't really be left out. Um, this is a model of the difference between GDL, goods dominant logic, and SDL, service dominant logic. And the only point I'm really trying to make is that um, management today really struggles to cope with a complex, fast-moving, changing world in which organizations have got vast, huge, things are changing. It's really difficult to run a company of 100,000 people that's operating in 100 countries. Never mind an, op an organization like the NHS, which is an order of magnitude larger than that. How do we do it then? And we won't be able to do it with the kinds of theories that are currently found, I believe, in business schools. So this would be another reason for upgrading. And that's the point I'm making there. Architecture is a natural, a natural field. Why? Because architecture is essentially something that's aesthetic. And if architecture is true of that, Anything that has an aesthetic as an important part of component of its practice becomes relevant. And the question I would ask is what practice does not include an aesthetic element within its practice? I think every human practice involves ultimately aesthetic. Architecture is simply one where some very good work has been done, it's very foreground, and it's very concrete, and it's big budget. It's an important area, and there are some people interested in cybernetics and in parity within it. My own research agenda is into the nature of organizational life, how it functions, and how it can be controlled. And um, I find that interesting, and someone else might as well. I'm happy to share, as, share it. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope there was at least one idea that, or thought that was useful to you. Um, uh, but I'm not really trying to put myself forward here. I am trying to, what I'm trying to put forward is the concept that we as a community need to pay a lot more attention to imparity than we have been. Thank you very much, Dr. Stewart.